Hola, chess people. Coach Matthew back with a game review and a history lesson in one. This game is from 1884. San Francisco, the first world championship caliber chess player to visit the Bay Area was Johannes Zuckertort in July 1884. He played a number of games, both with sight and blindfolded, and this is one of them. Player with the black pieces is uh, Franklin, and I have no idea as to uh, any sort of time controls. I have a feeling this was just a casual game. Um, a couple things about Zuckertort. He played two years after this for the first official world championship, which was also in the United States against Steinitz. Uh, he got out to a 4-1 to one lead and then proceeded to lose the match. He died two years after that. Zuckertort translates to sweet cake uh, from German, but at this point in 1884, Zuckertort was living in Great Britain and wrote, participated in a number of chess publications there, periodicals. And Zuckertort was the player who would, or the individual, who would basically lie about everything, exaggerate beyond belief. He spoke 14 languages. He had these many medals from battle and knew this duke and this count and was of noble descent and blah, 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 blah. But everything about his chess was true. Lies do not live on the chessboard. So he couldn't lie about his chess. He had to play, demonstrate it, uh, just like everybody else. So this was that guy, Zuckertort. And let's get into the game. We're going to be making some notes from a lot of different points of view. And here we go. OK, e4, e5, knight c3. We typically don't see this. Everybody plays knight f3, which is predictable and, from that point of view, boring. Remember Tall asking me a long time ago when we started working together, he says, Coach, I want to play something different, so I have an element of surprise. Good idea. Play something different. Everybody plays Knight F3, at least at the scholastic level when they start off. Beginning intermediate players, you're playing U1500. You're going to see more E4, E5, Knight F3, Knight C6 than you ever thought you would see. That's all you're going to see for the most part. You're going to see other things, don't get me wrong. But that'll be heavily featured, at least over the years historically. So Knight C3 is different. If you play what everyone else plays, and even if it's better than them, at least initially, it's going to be the same. So if it's different... It gives the opponent a chance to go astray that much quicker because they haven't seen it before, and that means they have to figure it out. Not that knight c3 is terribly complicated right now, but this can lead to very, very fun play for white. And black plays a move I don't recommend. So let's add something to the notes here first. Let's add play something different, as in an opening or a defense. Maybe. Depends on your approach. In the opening, I like to try to give the opponent many, many ways to go wrong and then take advantage and win. Uh, not that I'm trying to be lazy, necessarily, but I want to give them many choices that are bad, and one or two that are good. And then if they choose well, we have an even game. And if they don't, I win. So play something different. Gives them a chance to go astray. Black plays knight f6. I would prefer knight c6. Why? Well, 
because of a move like this. Pawn f4. Most of us have been told by me, some of the people <laughs> I'm sure, not to move the f-pawn, not to move the f-pawn. Well, if you can move the f-pawn and still have a safe king, you get that much more help in the center. If black had not played knight f6 on the prior move and played knight c6, this move is gives black another option. Black can try to take and hang on to the pawn. But here you really can't keep the pawn if you decide to take on f4. So let's write down f pawn. Now, if we can use the f pawn safely, you get that much more help in the center. So the f pawn is very double edged. The theme of the opening is central control. That f pawn is helping in the center. Here is, well, we still see this these days in response to the Vienna locally, the Vienna Gambit. And white has gotten in pawn f4. Black does not handle the position properly. When Tall would play these systems, he would score very well because the opponent hadn't seen it before. And this is pretty sharp stuff for white. And it is a lot of fun to play. And if black plays passively, white is just completely better positionally. And if black blunders, it's just going to be over with in the opening. So white is gambiting. And if you're the black pieces and you're in this situation, and it's going to happen, and it's okay. It's definitely okay. You're not ever going to be prepared for every single gambit out there. It's just not possible. So you're always going to see something new. So what to do about all these gambits? No problem. No problem. All you need to remember is this. D5. If white's gambiting and you have no idea what to do, try to get in a good d5. And once you've done that, you've busted the gambit. I'm not saying you're winning, but you've stopped the gambit. Playing against a gambit, the secret is d5. Get in d5. Here, black can get in d5. Play actively. Black doesn't do that. So d5 is the gambit buster. Let's add that to our notes. or. Let's see it first here. Let's play d5. What happens next? Um, let's say take. OK, I takes. If the f pawn moves in the opening, typically we're going to see a knight f3 to cover the diagonal, the e1. 1h4 diagonal because the pawn isn't there anymore. Okay, this is this is no problem for black. Black is fine. No problem. They're not squished. They're getting some play, getting the pieces out. No problem. At that point against Zugertort in terms of the position. Not the opponent, necessarily. OK, so let's see. In the actual game, we have passive play. Passive play, which is all too common against the Vienna. So let's go back to our notes here. d5 is the gambit buster. That's very important. You don't see enough gambits? Well, maybe you don't. Uh, maybe I don't, that's what I mean. Uh, but there aren't enough gambits played. I think in the, if you're an up and coming scholastic player, you know, you're a beginning intermediate player, and you're playing at the club level, you're playing U1800, you U1500, you U2100, play gambits. And I don't necessarily mean the Queen's Gambit, but play that too. Uh, but try out risque gambits. Uh, if you're the type 
who's doing the tactics on a regular basis and those styles, those systems suit your style. Go ahead and play gambits. As we'll see, gambits can put a lot of pressure on the opponent and that pressure is real. And if they don't navigate the waters successfully, you win if your game is sharp and you're familiar with the lines and the ideas and the game plan overall. And I've you see it all the time. I remember one of the local students who went from 1,000 to 1,900. Not one of my students, but a kid from Cupertino went from 1,000 to 1,900 in one year, playing a bunch of gambits and doing everything that needed to be done with those gambits uh, away from the tournament hall. And it was cool. He was always down a pawn. Always. He was, you know, on the board, the material, he was down, but his pieces were brilliant. He was completely crushing his opponents every single, pretty much every single game uh, up until he got, you know, to the open section. So gambits. D5 is the gambit buster. Try to figure out how to get it in. Here we see black not do that and gets pushed around. Black gets pushed around with this knight c6. White can now manipulate the center. Take. Knight takes. White to play. How do you take more of the center? d4. And we see the ideal pawn center. This knight gets biffed by a pawn. Let's go back and add ideal pawn center. This knight retreats. White continues to push their mobile center. Hitting the knight, it's got to back off and goes back where it started. This is unfortunate for the rook on h8, who is now stalemated. Okay, now that the king's knight has moved, the queen is eyeballing h4. And anytime you move the f-pawn, the king is exposed on the king's side, and that tactically may be a big problem. But here, of course, it's white's turn to move, so it's a non-issue. You play knight f3 in those situations. If you're playing an f4 as white, you are going to probably have to play a knight f3. It's going to cover the king. And if you don't do that, queen h4 can be a disaster. It's just like Damiano's mate, just reverse, Damiano's defense. Uh, you need to be extremely careful with your king if you move the f-pawn diagonally on the king's side uh, from attacks from that angle. Okay, so knight f3 and d6. Sucretort is simply going to get the pieces out. I don't know if this game at this point was part of a simul. It was not a blindfolded game. Not this game. And it wasn't at odds. Back then they played a lot of odds chess, whereas if you were the stronger player you would play without whatever piece. A knight, a, a bishop, a pawn, a rook. You name it. Odds games were very in vogue back then. Superdart takes with the pawn. Okay. Bishop c5. Another common idea. Now let's... When the f-pawn moves, these diagonals can become a problem on a bad day, but something to keep in mind for the player who's moved the f-pawn, uh, certainly at the very least, uh, to make it a good day. Now, if you move the f-pawn castling long with these Vienna gambits, the, excuse me, castling long can sometimes be the only option if you're going to castle if they flat out just attack the diagonal and you don't seek to interpose. You don't put a bishop on e3. If white puts a bishop on e3, of course you can't do that now. You'd have to prepare it. But you can try to shield the king and then go short, or you can outright just go long. So bishop c5 is a common thematic move against any kind of f4 system, just to be maybe annoying 
And is this annoying to Zucretort? Uh, not really, no. Depends on how annoyed black wants to be. So here we see bishop g5. This is nice. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can handle this, of course. Bishop g5, and does black want to, you know, do you want to walk into a pin on e7 and not attack out of it, as in put a knight on e7, or do you want to counter with your bishop? Franklin interposes the bishop, and that allows bishop e3 to cover the diagonal, so Zuckertort can castle either way. Let's add something to the notes. If you move the F pawn, watch the diagonals. Well, let's add play knight F3. Immediately thereafter, meaning if they're threatening queen H4, you need to play knight F3 beforehand. Unless your king can go to f1 and you're setting a trap because you're Anderson or something like that, and then go ahead. And that that system is fun too. Uh, we don't see that enough these days. So if you move the f pawn, play knight f3 immediately there afterwards and watch the diagonals. Watch a7 to g1. The knight f3 will cover the other one. All right. So bishop b3 covering g1 if Zuckertort decides to castle short. Bishop g4. Okay. Pinning. Castle short. Now when you do have a good day and you move your f-pawn, it can be a really good day because this rook on f1 all of a sudden looks tremendous. This rook has x-ray on f7, only sustained by the king. Can white try to coordinate on f7? You bet. So many pieces can potentially help on that square. Black has only developed three pieces, is at least two moves from castling. White has already castled a move away from connecting the rooks more space, better center control, better piece quality. Black is in a lot of trouble here. It's advisable for the black pieces to castle as soon as possible. Probably short. That looks to be much simpler. Get the king out of the middle. Now, what does that mean? What do you have to do? Well, it means you have to move your g8 knight. There's only one square it can go to, h6. But here, I don't think there's a choice. Now, did the opponents of Zuckertorts back then in 1884 know how dangerous he was over the board? I would think so, after, especially after they saw him play. Um, but I don't know. Nonetheless, don't underestimate your opponent, no matter what year it is, or where you're playing, or who you are, or who they are. So instead of knight h6, which doesn't look so great, but at least it looks like black can try to castle. Franklin is greedy and takes a pawn. He goes pawn grabbing while his opponent is castled and his king isn't, and isn't close to being castled. Takes on e5. Does he calculate? I don't know, but this is a forcing move and needed to be calculated. White to play. And I like the fact that, uh, well, this is from 1884. What has survived from then uh, from the chess playing world uh, in the Bay Area back then, I don't know, uh, but this game has, and it's because somebody recorded the game, so those of us watching this video do record your games, do record your games, you can review them later, others can review them and enjoy them later, people can learn from them later, it's good a good habit period to get into, it allows you to work on your games that you've played, 
uh, which makes your game that much stronger. Record your games. And if you're playing on a computer, of course the machine is going to record your games. Uh, so do save that. If you write them down physically, put them in a shoebox, put them in a binder, put them all together in one location. And then you can take advantage. And they can be archived and you can enjoy them hundreds of years later, perhaps. Okay, so 95. White to play. What was Zuckertort's other name? Well, it was Tactics, Tactics, Tactics. Yeah, uh, back then especially. Night takes night. How does this cookie crumble? Well, black is going to give up two pieces for the queen and then have a discovery on the D file they're going to have to deal with. So Franklin takes, rook takes, get a rook into play early so you can get both rooks into play early. So there's a hit on f7, this bishop b5 check is threatening to win the material back. Uh, but here is black, you can't, you can't hang on to the queen tactically, you just can't. If you try, you give up too much material. You have to give her back. You have to give her back. Sometimes in chess, when you're up material, you have a choice. You can give it back and stay in the game somewhat. Or you keep it and you lose. You get checkmated. You can't keep it. Here, the queen cannot be kept. Black tries to keep the queen by shielding it. Bishop d6, interposing an ally on the d-file. This doesn't quite work tactically. And Zuckertort takes advantage. Knight takes, hitting the queen and d6. Of course, the king may not take. Queen moves. If she goes to d7, uh, it's really not much different. The white pieces start to dominate black's camp. Generally speaking, attack squares in the opponent's half of the board. Attack squares in the opponent's half of the board. It gives you restriction of their mobility and pieces. It gives you attacking options. And black here gets in huge trouble because white owns a great deal of black's territory of importance. Let's add that to our notes. This is important. I've seen it time and time again where there'll be a student rated, say, whatever, playing in, say, an age level or grade level event and they're playing another student 400, 500 points higher. And the higher rated student maybe doesn't have the best attitude and thinks they can just show up and go through the motions and win. And the lower rated student, not that Zuckertort is lower rated at all back then, at this point there were no ratings, uh, but the lower rated student may just do what they're supposed to do as a chess player and Try to castle first, attack squares in the opponent's half of the board, finish development, and do have those ideas checked off on their to-do list while also looking for threats. And the lower rated player will usually come out on top. Uh, perhaps it's just the attitude, but attacking squares in the opponent's half of the board is very important. Restriction is huge. So... Bishop check. Uh, the king can't move. King goes to the f-file. It's a disaster waiting to happen. So instead they block with the c-pawn, but what does this leave behind? This leaves behind the d6 square, which white is attacking twice. And black is defending with one piece. 
So we have superiority of force. Superiority of force. Let's add that to our notes. More attackers than the opponent has defenders. So the knight takes and gives a check. And this gets ugly real quick. Note how white's rooks are incredibly strong and black's are the definition of passive. Me takes, rook takes. Things fall pretty quickly here. Pawn takes bishop. And we see the knight come forward and take back. Threatening to go to c7. Black's king is in a lot of trouble here. They're outnumbered. The king is under duress. Down pawns. This is just losing. Rook moves. And here there's a lot of ways to proceed. Given is bishop g5. And white goes on to win. That's what's given. So... This is chess in San Francisco from 1884. Zuckertort, who two years after this went on to contest the world, the first world chess championship against Steinitz. He would lose that match and Steinitz would go on to become the first official world chess champion. This is two years before that. This is before there was a city incorporated called Fresno. It's going way back, I guess. So why does Zuckertort win? Well, the opening was not handled properly by Franklin, and Franklin plays extremely passively. He gets pushed around in the center. Avoid passivity. We saw we're going to add a little more to our notes here. Here we see the biff of a pawn. A pawn advancing and attacking a minor piece and the minor piece has to retreat. So the minor piece is giving the pawn tempo. It's giving the pawn that space with a threat. We're just going to add the biff. A biff is a punch to the face. It makes the opponent back off. The pawn is just, it's just punching. Psh, 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 back off, back off. So the piece has to back off. The knight got biffed by the pawn. And here, black is getting completely pushed around via the center. Note how Zuckertort is able to use his center because black has no say in it whatsoever. Black has nothing in the center here. Zero. So let's add that to our notes. Theme of the opening. Central control. Now here, at this point, um, is it too late for black? No, against Zuckertort, yes. Uh, but at the club level, this isn't over yet. The opponent can blunder. But black has made it that much more difficult on themselves. So it's an uphill climb. There's no doubt about it. Okay. We're going through just again for notes here. Just for notes. All right, so... Castle first. I looked at a game last night, the first recorded game with castling. The first known game with castling. Uh, which direction was the first recorded castle in chess history as we know it now? Was it kingside or queenside? Go find out. It's interesting. Okay. So castle first, so you can do what? 
well, not keep your king in the center. So let's add a note about this. This is losing by force, by the way. Uh, whether or not black does not try to keep the queen. Let's see here. Castle first. Finish development. Well, no. Let's add connect the rooks. Castle first, then you connect the rooks. Doesn't mean you finish development. Castle, connect the rooks. Then finish development. How about that? Whoops. Okay. So castle, connect the rooks, finish development. Don't go pawn grabbing, pawn hunting with your king uncastled. Especially not when they've already castled and are pretty much a couple moves from everybody being in play. So let's add that to our notes. Don't. Go pawn hunting. With your king in the middle. Extremely dangerous. I think we see why in this game. Pawn hunting, does that look funny? That looks kind of funny. That still looks funny. Whatever. It's the idea that matters, not how I type it. Okay, so don't go pawn hunting with your king in the middle. And if we're approaching this, how can we find a line as Zuckertort did? Well, this is a forcing line. The knight taking is a forcing move. And the knight taking on e5 is a forcing move. So as bishop takes. So these... And the rook taking back on d1 is a forcing move. So with forcing moves, we can see the future in chess. We haven't done the extra mile video yet, but I should do that soon since I'm talking about it now. But in chess, you can see the future via forcing moves. So Zuckertort knows that this line is in his favor. Forcing move. Take, take, take. Here, let's say Zuckertort's opponent does not try to save the queen. What might this look like? Well, do you want to get in trouble on f7? No. Knight takes f7 is a problem. So you have to play something about the f7 square. Let's play f6. Yikes. Okay, check. And okay, the material is coming back. Okay, so if black decides not to be cheap and try to keep the queen, which they cannot do, are they still in the game? Yeah, you can play this. I wouldn't want to against Zuckertort and try to do anything other than lose but it would be fun you're still playing the game you're still in it you're down yeah you're probably gonna lose yeah but you're still in it uh so forcing moves cctq let's add that to the notes cctq what does that stand for checks Captures, threats, as in real, queen attacks. So when it's our turn to move, we need to calculate the forcing moves and see where they lead. As in, I'm looking at a move that gives check, followed by a capture, followed by another capture, followed by a threat, followed by another capture. You need to keep going down these forcing moves until you get to a position with no forcing move and that's the position you evaluate do you have anything there and you can go down these paths into the future possible positions and 
know whether or not it's beneficial for you. It may be a little difficult to calculate, but we can see the future via forcing moves in chess. So CCTQ, let's clean this up a little bit. That's the acronym for forcing moves. CCTQ, get used to this. We see this all, this, in terms of forcing moves, well, if you want to play in the open section, you are going to be calculating forcing moves, whether you like it or not. And if this is just not your cup of tea, you just, I don't feel like calculating everything, well, you won't be playing in that section, period, unless you're really lucky, which is not going to be the case. It's going to be bad luck. So you have to calculate in chess, you can proceed down paths that guarantee the result that you want, and the opponent can't do anything about it. It's entirely forced. So CCTQ, and that has to be combined with going the extra mile. I'll do that video this weekend. Those of you at home, a lot of you know what this means already. Go the extra mile. That means get to that position that has no forcing move. Evaluate that position. Okay. Let's just clean up the notes here a little bit more. These are all forcing moves, mind you. Check. All right, so here, the dust is settling. Uh, can we add anything further to the notes? Yeah. Now, you're clearly winning here as the white pieces. Zukatort's clearly winning. And the move he plays is fine. Is it the strongest move? Mm, no. But does it really matter? Well, for our intents and purposes here, no, it doesn't really matter. The point is to finish strong. So let's add that. Number one, finish strong. Which bishop g5 does, no doubt. And also be comfortable. Meaning if there's a knockout move that just ends in immediately, but it's very, it, it's really intricate and complex and it's a, perhaps a little risky and there's a very simple straightforward way that works and you know it and you know that you know it and you retain all of your decisive advantages without a doubt. Be comfortable. Be comfortable. You want to make sure that you don't add any unnecessary stress to the situation. Be comfortable, but be able to finish strong. If you do have to walk that that high wire, um, you're going to have to do that in chess. Uh, the position will tell you if that's the case. But sometimes, and here, Zukertort is comfortably winning. Without a doubt, he's up a piece and a pawn. This is over. He's completely winning. He can play bishop g5 as opposed to go for the checkmate right now. He can do this. It's just fine. So be comfortable when you finish. Note how this rook here, maybe I shouldn't use green, but that rook is green light for not being able to move. So this is probably red. Red light. Stop. Don't go. This is tragic. With this knight, and black could have developed the knight to h6. So let's add a last note. Let's talk about a to-do list. Now some of us make lists. A to-do list in chess, in the opening, and the middle game by definition is reached when somebody castles. Well, hopefully that's you. And if not, get to that middle game. Get your king castled. Don't neglect that. 
So on the to-do list, and have a to-do list in chess, just a couple of items to check off. On our to-do list, early in the game, we have castle, and you already know these. Connect the rooks. Finish development. Doesn't mean this is the plan. Doesn't mean this is what you try to do in order. No. But at some point, you do want to achieve these objectives. Doesn't mean these are your primary objectives. I have to castle before I deal with threats or the center. No. Wrong. But you do, on a good day, want to castle, want to connect the rooks, finish development. Yes, yes, yes. So keep a to-do list uh, in mind. And black here, you could have, you know, could play knight h6. It's not a move you want to play, but you don't have a lot of choice. You're playing Zuckertort in San Francisco, 1884. Uh, chess was dangerous back then, just as it is now. So this is, this is not the final position. Hang on. Okay, so... This is the final position given with the notation, and Zuckertort goes on to win. This is Johannes Zuckertort against Salim Franklin, San Francisco, California, 1884. Thank you for watching.